According to George Bernard Shaw, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. Dialogue, healthy dialogue, is the foundation of solid, respectful relationships. And for anyone who looks at and understands the relationship between Ottawa and Alberta, they know it has been toxic, controlling, and hostile. Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier in 1905 divided up the Northwest Territories, and in doing so, he forever ensured that Alberta would be subservient to Ottawa. Laurier's Minister of the Interior, Clifford Sifton, in 1904 said, We desire, in fact, every patriotic Canadian desires that the great trade of the prairies shall go to enrich our own people in the east, to build up our factories and our workshops and contribute in every way to our prosperity. The Canadian Sifton was referring to were those in Ottawa, not Canadians from coast to coast. It is a mindset and it has been the practical reality since Alberta was created by Ottawa in 1905. Ottawa was fully aware of the oil in the Athabasca Basin going back to the late 1800s. And the basin is also home to one of the world's richest high-grade uranium supplies. The region, all of which was the Northwest Territories, was and continues to be the economic engine of Canada. The winds of separation blew through Alberta in the 1980s when people had enough, but then they were calmed when investment in oil sands soared, providing billions of dollars in employment and taxes. And any hint of discontent literally evaporated during the early 2000s. Then the Saudis, in an effort to undermine American oil production, crashed the price of oil and also crashed the Alberta economy. Over the past few years, Ottawa received in excess of $600 billion in transfer payments from Alberta alone. Then, as Alberta's economic boom calmed, tensions between Ottawa and Edmonton grew. They grew to the point where an appetite for separatism reemerged, and it continues to grow. Independence parties started to crop up, and now a coalition of separatist groups is formed under the Wild Rose Independence Party banner. We invited Paul Hinman, the leader of the Wild Rose Independence Party, to join us for a conversation that matters about why he says the time to act is now. Conversations That Matter is a partner program of the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the following and viewers like you. Please become a patron at conversationsthatmatter.tv. Paul Hinman. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you, Stuart. Appreciate the opportunity. Well, we consider that dialogue is vitally important in any relationship. Would you say the growing sense of alienation in Alberta is rooted in the fact that communication with Ottawa is anything but dialogue? You know, how would you characterize the mood in the province? Well, I think it's still mixed. Um, I'm always surprised to the number of, of so-called patriots that uh, are... are I guess emotionally attached to Canada that uh, aren't really suffering in the way that, that those who are being oppressed uh, by our current situation and struggling in their businesses and their life. Um, but th there, there's certainly a, a greater split and more and more Albertans every day are coming to realize that, that Ottawa is not our friend. We saw a surge in support for independence and the need to send a message to Ottawa following the last federal election. However, under the cover of COVID, it's as though the Kenny government has said, yeah, 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 we've already addressed the independence issues uh, that were clearly on the minds of Albertans. It's as though the premier has determined he has addressed those issues and he can hide behind COVID and hope they'll go away. Well, <laughs> I, I find it quite amazing the way uh, Premier Kenny is cozying up to Trudeau and uh, got his hand out uh, asking you know, for this and for that, but yet uh, not insisting on the things that, that should be happening. You know, uh, that Nova Gas expansion line that was approved by the CER back on the 20th of February this year, he's been silent on that and that's been critical to our industry. For someone who, who campaigned on jobs, pipelines, and standing up to Ottawa, he's been silent on one of the biggest uh, projects that we needed, you know, $2.4 billion 
uh, of capital being invested, $1.5 billion of, of uh, uh, other drilling activities and stuff this winter, had that gone through, and yet he's been silent on that. And so I, I just don't understand his, his game other than the fact that he's maybe trying to work and get Aaron elected, but uh, shouldn't be at Alberta's expense. Do you think that his enthusiasm to be that strong Alberta voice is waning? Because he can? Because media is focused on COVID all the time? I, I, I would say COVID-19 is adding fuel to the independence fire. Uh, again, you know, with what Trudeau's putting out in these internment camps, uh, be able to, uh, I, I mean, Premier Kenny said he's going to roll back Bill 10 so they just can't come marched in our home and, you know, take somebody out and put them in a, a facility. Uh, no, there's been some very draconian, uh, heavy-handed uh, legislation by government, and I think that that's actually uh, fueling the fire for people realizing that, you know what, we, we need to be independent from Ottawa. What was your reaction when former Green Party leader Elizabeth May and Black Québécois leader Yves-Francois Blanchet said, don't send COVID relief to Alberta because of oil? As far as they were concerned, Alberta had only itself to blame because they erroneously believed the province was not innovating, was not shifting its economy. And yet all you have to do is look at the work of Innovate Alberta to see that that is exactly what happens right now, is happening right now, that innovation is underway. What was that moment like for you when you heard from those two federal party leaders? Well, for, for me, it was no surprise. Those people have been speaking out against, and Trudeau himself saying that, you know, they want to phase out. They, they, they'd be happier if they could shut it down tomorrow. And COVID's giving them an opportunity of shutting down businesses. And no, uh, absolutely no surprise. Hopefully it had a few more Albertans wake up to realize that, look, uh, Ottawa... Uh, is, is no friend of Alberta. The, our two biggest industries, oil and gas and the beef industry, agriculture, uh, they're, they're not fans of it. They would like to buy their beef in a petri dish and call it Beyond Meat. Um, and there's no question that they want to have a carbon-free society when they're clueless of all the benefits and all the products that come from carbon. And, and the, it's almost a miracle product on bringing quality of life and food to the world, and yet they're so ignorant and naive of the reality of life uh, that they're just disconnected from it. And so no surprise at all that they said that. Th these are individuals that are uh, elitists, and they, they live in a, in a fantasyful, fantasyful, fantasyful world, in my opinion. Tell me about the Wild Rose Independence Party. How did the party come together? And what happened that brought other independence parties together in this coalition? Well, as, as, as you mentioned, you know, after the last election when Trudeau got in, that, that really spurred on the Wexit movement and, and people saying, you know what, we, we don't want any part of this anymore. If Trudeau's our prime minister, we want out. And, and that really did cause a, uh, what would I say, a chain reaction with over 200, 300,000 people, you know, going online and, and, and saying that, yeah, this is what we need to do. Um, and so those individuals with Wexit started to go out and to go through the political process of, of getting registered as a party. And as they were doing that, they were uh, speaking with the old Freedom Conservative Party, which is a registered party and ran some individuals in the last election. And it says, hey, you know, we, we, we've got the same goals, same purposes. We should come together and uh, we can just meld the boards together and, and move forward. And they came up with the name, the Wild Rose Independence Party of Alberta. And so they, they changed the name and the board came together. And the day of the vote, um, I got my first phone call and they said, you know, we're looking for an interim leader. Uh, were you interested? And I laughed and said, no, absolutely not. And got the second uh, phone call. And finally, after five phone calls and some long discussions and they send me some papers, I realized, you know, somebody's got to step forward to do this. Uh, at the start of a political party, you know, uh, you can look at your political capital much like your own investment capital, and you don't want to put it uh, in, in foolish places and lose it. And so people that have a lot of political capital and have been politicians for a long time look at something like this and say, oh, I'm not going to touch it with a 10-foot pole. 
Um, it's not the way I am. I look at things that, wow, this needs to be done. Uh, who's going to do it? And when they were having a struggle of finding anybody to step forward, I thought, you know what, let's roll up our sleeves again and go to work be because I'm very concerned about my children and grandchildren in the future of this province. And long story short, you know, status quo isn't working. You see the way Trudeau is attacking uh, Western Canada, Alberta in particular. Uh, we, we just got to come together. And, and again, that, that's the, you, you understand the momentum in here as these different groups are contacting uh, the Wild Rose Independence Party and say, you know, there's strength in numbers, we need to come together and we need to be credible. But I, I'm excited with all the groups that are out there. I think the, the more that are working and gathering people up, we have two and a half years to the next election. And I think you'll see everybody, you know, coming together prepared for that one. As far as others, other politicians who have political capital that they could invest in the building of a better relationship with Ottawa or work with others towards an independent Alberta, what is your message to them? Well, I guess if there's any of those out there, absolutely uh, contact us, uh, share us your concerns, and we're, we're very open and amiable to discussions and very focused on what we need to do to prevent Alberta from ba basically losing our major industries and our economic viability in the future. When you look at the Fair Deal panel that Premier Kenny created, do you look at that panel as nothing more than an exercise now that you've seen the outcome? And I ask that because the panel's recommendations were not only late in their delivery, and the recommendations were only marginally different than those of the firewall letter, which was issued some 20 years ago. <laughs> Well, I, I guess that, that it appears to me, looking backwards, that that was a political strategy to try to appease people and to prolong the, the, the process so that he could have something to deliver to Albertans in the next election, is the way I look at it now. Uh, I was very disappointed that uh, they didn't release it when they should have way back in February. Very disappointed with his answers. And, and the biggest one of all for me, though, was when he was on the Daniel Smith show and says, I'm an unqualified patriot and, and we're not going to separate. And I just thought, wow, you know, it doesn't matter how dysfunctional, how broken, uh, how partisan, how, you know, political this is, we're in this till death do we part. And, and sorry, Premier, but, but no, we're, we're not going to accept that kind of treatment from Ottawa. Uh, maybe you will, and maybe your goal is to get back to Ottawa, but, but we need to protect Alberta and our future here. Interestingly enough, the Fair Deal panel is an appropriate name because that is what Albertans want. They want a fair deal. However, when we take a look at the relationship between Ottawa and Alberta in particular, it's anything but fair. The history of this relationship goes back to the creation of Alberta as a province, and it's important to remember that Ottawa created Alberta, as I mentioned in the intro, so that it could ensure the West was under its control and that it could uh, be the benefactor of the riches that came out of the area. The, the Milch cow has been the long-standing relationship between the West and Ottawa. Now, as more and more people are standing up saying, we've had enough and we're seriously looking at independence, what does that declaration mean? What does it do and how will that force Ottawa's hand to actually listen to renegotiate the agreements that are in place that do Alberta a disservice? What will calling a vote on independence do? Well, I, I just think philosophical, philosophically that there's nothing to renegotiate. These people are set in their ways. Uh, we have a constitution here in Canada. That constitution is very flawed. Uh, it basically allows uh, what I want to call tyranny of the majority. The, the seven wolves can vote to take the five sheep from the five lamb and every, or the, from the five uh, ewes, and everything's legal about that. And, and so this tyranny of the majority is part of our current constitution, and there's many aspects, as you're well aware of, you know, everything from voter representation to regional discrepancies. And it, it, there's just so many uh, bias uh, programs from the federal government and the taxation system that it's to our detriment that I just think anybody who thinks there's ever going to be a fair deal or a renegotiation is delusional. And that's why uh, my purpose, 
personal goal is to just put our house in order. That there's about six things that we need to do. Um, and again, whenever you're in a broken or dysfunctional relationship, you know, whether uh, it is personal or in the business, there's things that you need to do. And, and the first one is, is you need to separate the money. And so I, I say we need to, to, put, to put together the Alberta Revenue Agency and collect all of the taxes here and have Alberta workers uh, employed and, and doing that. Um, we need to have our own environmental act. It is very clear that, that their views and their understanding of the environment and purpose of the environment is very different than ours. Um, I think Alberta is pristine, is beautiful. We got world-class environmental um, protection here. And, and sure, we've made some messes in the past, but look around the world. Uh, that, that's just the history of mankind. We're learning. And Alberta's technology, especially when it comes to the environment, is, is, is spreading around the world on, on how to extract your resources responsibly and then have the benefit of carbon in our lives. And so th those two things have to happen. We, we absolutely need to have an Alberta Revenue Agency. We need to have our own environmental act. Uh, and not have the oversight of, of Easterners who want to use carbon uh, but deny it uh, in their lives or hypocrites in my opinion. And then there's four things that you know are, are constitutionally okay to do. We need our own police force. We don't need uh, uh, Trudeau saying to do this or do that and sending out his, his cronies. Uh, we need our own pension plan. Uh, you know the federal plan has uh, uh, what would I say? It, it, it's flawed. And, and again, Alberta in the past has been averaging almost $3 billion extra a year going into the pension plan. And we should actually be building one up so that we don't have unfunded liabilities. Here, here's the actual pension plan. Had we done what Quebec did when they started theirs, um, Albertans would be in a very enviable situation, but, but instead we're on the other way around. But that would quickly turn around, like I say, if we had our own Alberta pension plan. We need our own employment insurance plan, but it's just crazy the different uh, treatment across this country and how people qualify and those who don't. Uh, it's just wrong and we need our own uh, immigration policy. But if we put those six things um, in order and start doing them here in Alberta, we'll, we'll start to uh, ha have a future and a possibility. But if we don't put those six things in, I think everything's uh, jeopardy and, and I just don't see a future for Alberta. We're just part of a sinking ship. There are political parties that are easy to dismiss as single issue parties. To that end, do you, as an independence party, also have a plan that extends beyond simply seeking independence, a plan to run the government, a plan to reinvigorate the Alberta economy and once again make the province attractive to investors, which, to be frank, isn't what's happening any longer? Uh, absolutely a problem and, and for those who say that oh you can't even talk about this because investment's going to leave I actually think that no we would start to attract investment as we put our house in order and uh, absolutely there's a lot more to it than, than that you know our health care system is uh, nothing to be proud of we pay a premium price for poor service once we get in it's great but the wait times and the struggles are terrible um, we need more frontline workers. We need to axe all of the middle management. We need to go back to like regional health health regions that are that are actually looking after their area and not uh, waiting for Edmonton to tell them to do this or do that. Our education system needs to be revamped. I mean, J Jason promised a summer of repeal, and and what a joke that was. I mean, there was no repealing. They revised a few and amended a few bills. But, but we need to refocus on the better education that, that's looking at, at you know, the, 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 the real core uh, issues in educating and not so much manipulating and the propaganda that our kids are going through. Uh, when it comes to even such things as our infrastructure and transportation, I'm just appalled that, you know, the last month I've been traveling in rural Alberta and, and there are, are, are secondary highways in this province with six inch gaps and six inches deep that they didn't even do the maintenance on this year. And again, they're out doing projects and there are different uh, MLA ridings uh, and that's great they're doing that. But the priorities is in maintenance. I mean, when you take the Yellowhead east of Edmonton, it's just unbelievable how bad that road is. And here's winter time, and, and now our opportunity to repair those is over. How much damage are we going to have next year? And so good government is actually prioritizing the, the, the needs and, and not trying to do projects that are, you know, oh, isn't this exciting? We're, we're building this or we're building that. 
and, and you know, for years I've been talking about a, a, a prioritized public infrastructure uh, list, and, and you know, here, here it is, you know, here, here's the top uh, 100 projects, uh, starting with what's most important and going down, and we're going to spend a, you know, a, 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 what would I say, a, a, an amount of money that we know how much, $7 billion, $10 billion, and you know, what can we do over the next year so that industry knows that we're spending $7 billion a year, $7.5 billion the next year, and they actually get sized to, to do what needs to be done instead of fluctuating up and down. But, but that list isn't public and it isn't prioritized. It, it's, it, what it is is politicized, and if somebody needs, if they need votes over here, oh, let's go do a project here. Sounds as though you are somewhere between free market conservatism and libertarianism. Is that an accurate representation of your party? You know, when you say in between, to, to me, I, I believe in a constitutional democracy that recognizes the supremacy of God and the rule of law. And, and again, that goes back to the basic, what, what is the purpose and why do we have government? And we come together to, to protect ourselves um, from, I, I want to say, outside forces. Uh, that, that if you don't have the rule of law, you know, you have mobs and gangsters and, and all of those things that go on. But, but it's the individual that you have to protect. And you can't say, like the socialists do, oh, this is the good for society. No, what's good for the individual will be good for the society. You don't sacrifice so many individuals to say, this is for the good of society. This is what all the atrocities throughout the world have been about, and saying, oh, this is the good for society. And I, I've never seen a case where it is. Um, it, it's about protecting the individual. And so I, I guess that's a libertarian, but... Uh, I, I don't know. It, to me, it's about protecting the individuals, those individuals being educated, making their own decisions, and, and, and deciding their risk in life, and, and not a government who says you can or can't do this. I mean, if you had all these people in charge uh, of mountain climbing, they, they would absolutely shut it down. They, they would not say that we can climb Mount Everest. It's too risky. And I agree. I don't want to. I don't want to be an expert. don't want to try that. But is government the one to, to, to put on these bands and these limits saying what we can and can't do? Um, the world would not be where it is if it wasn't for all the risk takers and the entrepreneurs that were risking their capital or their lives um, in order to see progress. And, and that's just, to me, just the fundamental, essential element is, is that freedom to choose and to, to try something. Paul Hanman, thank you for joining me to record this conversation. And with your permission, I'd like to check in with you from time to time to see how things are going. Well, really appreciate this opportunity, and I'll, I'll look forward to a report back in the, in the future. So thank you very much.